So four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, and two to five years of residency, is that really all it takes to become a doctor in Canada or have things changed in the past 10 years? Hey everyone, my name is Don. I'm a general surgery resident uh, in Canada. Uh, and today we're gonna be talking about why surgery training is even longer than you might think. So I think that people know in general that becoming a doctor or becoming an independent licensed doctor takes a long time and it feels like people are in school forever. But something that's becoming a bigger and bigger trend in medicine is that people like anywhere else in any other field are becoming more and more qualified and competitive. And in this day and age, it's crazy to think, but undergraduate or just a bachelor's degree are not always sufficient to uh, get you an advantage when you go out and work. And that obviously depends on what field you're in and what people value in that certain field. But generally, it seems as though people are staying in school for longer, getting a master's, getting several degrees, just to be competitive at a job that a few decades ago would not have required this level of education. And despite medicine having at baseline more training or more years or just known to be a little bit more extensive than other uh, fields, it has not been immune to that problem of academic inflation. So don't get me wrong, the requirements are still the same. For the most part, to become a doctor or surgeon that is independently practicing, people are doing four years of undergraduate degree, four years of medical school, and anywhere from two to five to six years of residency, depending on the type of specialty. That will get you all the qualifications necessary to be licensed to practice. But does that mean you're competitive to get that job? That's a tough question to answer, but there's a lot of trends nowadays that we're seeing among new um, doctors coming into the field that show us what it takes to become a competitive applicant for a job. What people say commonly is that there's a lot of work to be done, which basically just means that you're not gonna be unemployed as a doctor or uh, as a surgeon, but you might not have that exact dream position in a certain hospital that the, is the perfect size for you, which, and you're seeing this exact kind of patients that you wanna see in terms of your interests. So it is like anything else where you have to be competitive, shake hands and try to uh, find your way and building your own practice and career. What I'm gonna specifically talk about is more for the world of surgery and especially the world of academic surgery, which means that our surgeons who work in hospitals that are affiliated with universities, and generally they have titles of professor because they teach residents, they teach students, and have involvements in advancing the university's uh, profile in terms of surgical research or education. So if you haven't noticed, a lot of doctors have a bunch of letters after their last name, even more than their first and last name combined. Um, and it, it's it's kind of funny to me, it's like a subtle flex. It's it's. It's a bit ridiculous, like uh, no one really cares about all of these things that you're uh, qualified for. You're not supposed to, there's no point in writing your entire CV with these uh, letters and degrees, but uh, it's, it's very common and, and it's something that I guess uh, people find impressive. It's definitely something cool, like people worked hard number of years for these a few letters after their name, but uh, <laughs> as you can see about here, they're, they're it's a bit funny, come on. So adding up all the minimum amount of years to become a uh, licensed surgeon, you're looking at about 13 years uh, more or less depending where you go. But there are two main things that are making things a bit longer and are slowly becoming almost part of the curriculum or general requirements to be hired or to be considered competitive. So those two things are fellowships and graduate degrees. So fellowships are extra years of training that people take on in a subspecialty in their field. And sometimes it shifts completely their practice into only becoming that kind of surgeon or doctor, or sometimes it's more of an add-on where they can still be uh, practicing the broad scope of general surgery, for example, but also have a more specific practice of colorectal. I made a video talking specifically about general surgery and what kind of fellowships people do for that. But the main thing is that most of these fellowships are gonna be one to two years and that are done after residency. And what's more is that people are even doing two fellowships sometimes to have two areas of expertise. I would say anecdotally, just from having worked with a lot of surgeons in different universities, people who have been hired in the past five or 10 years 
they all have fellowships. It would be very unusual for a new surgeon to be hired in an academic center without having completed a fellowship. And, and that totally makes sense, right? You're, you're at this big university center, you're trying to bring in experts from um, all over the, the, the country and even from the, the United States. And so a lot of people are gonna train in the top centers um, in Canada or in the US, and then they're trying to bring back that uh, specialty to the university to bring uh, that kind of practice or it was something that uh, it was lacking in that division of surgery and this person can and can go and bring something unique back it totally makes sense but you got to think that fellowships are also a competitive application and one way that people become more competitive or just uh, again develop their uh, career orientation is that people are going to do the second thing that might prolong uh, surgical training and that is a graduate degree Graduate degrees vary widely, but commonly people are going to do masters or PhD in a wide variety of research that relates to surgery. So sometimes even basic science like stem cell or liver or basic organ uh, lab work and bench work. So people take time off during residency anywhere from like one to four years to complete a PhD and then they come back and complete their residency. And so that prolongs things. Other graduate degrees involve education, so like a master's or again a PhD in the field of education so that they can justify their career and be more competitive for an academic position where they're gonna be involved in teaching students and residents. Another common thing that you see now is that people do a master's of public health or an MPH, which is a very versatile degree because you can have several concentrations or majors within that and uh, varying from health policy, health management, um, or clinical epidemiology to help you out with research. And obviously you're not limited uh, to one degree. You can do a PhD and also do a master's of education, which makes you a well-rounded uh, person to work in an academic center, being uh, involved in research and education. Some people will refer to it as being a triple threat. So you can do clinical research and education. So people who are very ambitious, they can have a strong clinical practice where they see patients, they operate a few days. They can have a research lab where they work with graduate students, undergraduate students, medical students, and residents by producing papers and um, doing work that is pushing the boundaries of of the, uh, the field and be involved in education where they sit on the board of um, education for undergraduate uh, education or uh, they're just involved in having residents and involved in evaluating and uh, promoting residents. So you can see how someone who is in an academic center is gonna wear a few different hats and that can be very demanding on their time. It's definitely not for everyone, but people working in academic centers have all of these different things that they need to integrate in their life and balance. Most surgeons and surgery in general, they don't practice in an academic center in Canada. Okay, so what if you don't want to be this big shot academic surgeon that is you know, renowned in the country and you just want to go in the community and operate and help out as many people as possible? What does it take? But more and more we're seeing people becoming uh, more specialized and better trained and more competitive for the jobs that are considered good. So you might think of jobs in uh, suburban centers, things that are not too far away, in hospitals that are decent sized and um, that have maybe less call. So uh, you can go into remote areas and go into rural surgery and generally that's where there's a lot of uh, work and a lot of jobs that uh, people might not want to, to, to go and that, and that kind of just makes sense. People want to stay in the city for their life, for their lifestyle, for their kids. The people are less tempted to go out in um, rural areas, but that's still very much possible and it's probably a very, very good career for someone who wants a broad spectrum of practice. But even community surgery in the large uh, community centers around the area of Toronto, for example, these surgeons are more and more fellowship trained because they can justify it as an asset to the hospital to say that they um, they can do general surgery, but they uh, also are specialized in breast surgery or colorectal or minimally invasive. Obviously, not every smaller, medium-sized community hospital is going to have every single um, uh, subspecialty. For example, hepatobiliary is probably one that is reserved almost exclusively to academic centers because of the resources involved in taking care of these uh, patients. But even things like thoracics are becoming more and more common in uh, surrounding hospitals that are not necessarily academic or university affiliated. And thoracic surgery is a two-year fellowship after general surgery. So 
what's the point of this whole video here? I mean, I just want to be real with uh, people who, who might be considering a career in surgery, even if they're not in um, medicine or if you're a medical student now, if you're thinking about doing surgery, it's just about being prepared for what's to come and how much training and how things are a bit more extensive than I even thought when I started. So if you dream of being that big shot surgeon who has a slew of letters after their name because of the amount of degrees they've earned, um, it's, it's gonna take a while. It's gonna take a, a really long time. And it's not always easy to be on the grind all the time while you're uh, basically holding a full-time job. So all of that to say that things have changed quite a bit um, in terms of surgical training, uh, in terms of what people are expected to do as residents and what people are expected to do when they are surgeons or what they're supposed to do on the side. So I hope you learned something in this video and that I'm not scaring anyone from becoming a surgeon, um, but it's more of a realistic approach and realistic things to think about uh, now that uh, everything is becoming more competitive, including things outside of medicine. All right, so if you enjoyed this video, please share it with anyone you think would be interested, drop a comment, and make sure to subscribe to not miss my next video. Peace.